All right, you guys, let's finish up uh, talking about some graphs and also some qualitative displays, so ways we can uh, display uh, adjective kinds of data. All right, so first we want to talk about stem and leaf plots. So I'm sure many of you have done these if you've had stats before, uh, like in high school or something. If not, the key here is just figuring out what the heck your stem is going to be and then what your leaves are. All right, so let's look at this data. We have 21, 25, 25, 26, 27, and so forth. Notice that the tens digit, the two, the three, and the four, we're going to use those as our stems. And then for our leaves, we're going to order our ones digits. So let me grab my pen. So let's just take the twos. We have several data points that begin in the 20s. Okay, and first I have 21. So under the stem 2, I'm going to list a 1 for 21. I have two 25s, so I'm going to list two 5s. I have a 26, so I list one 6. A 27, so I list a 7. And a 28, so I list an 8. Okay, and these just take some practice, but in general I think you guys will find them pretty easy. All right. It is similar to a histogram in that we can get an idea of, of how our data is distributed, where is the majority of our data, and so forth. All right. And notice that all of our original data values are still intact. We can get back to our original data if all, all we had was a stem and leaf plot. All right, so let's actually do an example with a little bit um, more data. All right, the following are the numbers of text messages sent last week by the cellular phone users on one floor of a college dormitory. All right, so we want to display the data in a stem and leaf. The question is, what are our stems going to be? What are our leaves going to be? In this situation, we've got three-digit numbers, so like 155. What we would want is our stem to be the one, the, the one and the five, and let our leaf be the ones place. So, all right, notice, how, how do I even think that? How do I even get to that? Well, let's look at how our data ranges. Our data ranges from a lowest value of 78 to a highest value of 159. All right, we're going to use the rightmost digit as a leaf. All right, so, for, for instance, for, with 78, the 8 is going to be a leaf, which makes the 7 the stem. For 159, 9 is the rightmost digit, our leaf, and 15 is our stem. And so we're just going to now list stems, starting with 7, our smallest one, and going to 15, our largest one. All right, and for each data entry, we're going to list a leaf to the right of its stem. So, Let's begin by looking here on the left. This is an unordered stem and leaf plot. All right, so I lift, list my stems, 7 through 15, and I'm using my data and just listing the leaves as I come to them. So 78, this would be 105, 108, 109, 116. 114, 129, 126, and so you can see where given a certain stem, I'm just listing the leaves. And then eventually we do want it ordered, so we're going to take the unordered stem and leaf on the left and order our leaves smallest to largest on the right. And this, the right stem and leaf plot, the ordered one, would be our final product. Notice how both stem and leaves have a key. You've got to include a key so that somebody who is just looking at your stem and leaf plot knows what your stems are and what your leaves are. And so we can just take something like 155, call it our key, and draw, use the vertical bar to denote what is the stem and what is the leaf. In this case, 15 being the stem and 5 being the leaf. 
okay? And why do we do this, guys? Why do we even care? Well, it actually does give us an idea of how our data is distributed, all right? From the display, you can conclude that more than 50% of the cell, cell phone users sent between 110 and 130 text messages. All right, we can also see we've got this kind of outlier out here. This 78 seems far removed from everything else. All right, let's also talk about a dot plot. A dot plot is very similar to a stem and leaf plot, except we're going to list all of our numbers under the, the horizontal arrow, and we're going to use dots to denote where our data is. And so here you, you can see that we're listing all of our numbers from 20 to 45 and we're putting a dot above the number as it occurs. So since we have two 25 entries, we get two dots above 25. Since we only have one 26 entry, we're only getting one dot above the 26 and so forth. All right, let's go back to our text messaging data and try to construct a dot plot with it. All right, so that each data entry is included in the dot plot, the horizontal axis should include numbers between 70 and 160. Well, why the heck is that? Well, recall our smallest number is 78 and our largest number is 159. So by using 70 to 160, we're going to capture all of our data. All right, and to represent a data entry, all we do is we plot a point above the entry's position on the axis. Okay, if an entry is repeated, we plot another point above the previous point. All right, so what's our dot plot going to look like? Well, once we list all of our numbers, beginning with 70, going to 160, we're going to go through our data and make dots wherever our data exists. And so notice here, we have 5 at 126. Well, we should see that we get 5 126 entries. So there's 3, there's 4, hmm and there should be one more and I'm up oh, there it is all right and so we as you can see we have five entries of 126 okay and again what how does the dot plot help us well we can see that most values cluster between 105 and 148 and the value that occurs the most is 126 all right, you can also see, again, similar to that stem and leaf, that that data point of 78, which is way out here, seems a little odd to us. All right, let's talk about a pie chart. All right, so now we want to get into being able to graph qualitative data. Okay, so a pie chart is just a circle divided into sectors that represent categories. The area of each sector is proportional to the frequency of each category. All right, proportional, remember, just means percentage. All right, and so each area or each um, pizza slice, we'll call it, is going to represent the percentage of the frequency of that category. All right, so let's take a look at an example. The numbers of earned degrees conferred in thousands in 2007 are shown in the table. We want to take this data and make a pie chart. Well, how are we going to do that? All right, well, first we need to calculate the relative frequency. Hopefully you remember from the first lecture this week that the relative frequency is just going to be the actual frequency divided by the sum of all the frequencies or the sample size. So by adding up all my frequencies, I see that the sum of the frequencies is 3,007. Don't let this crazy sigma scare you. It's just stats language for telling you to add everything up, sum all the frequencies. All right, and so if I want my associate's relative frequency, I'm just going to take the 728 and divide it by 3007 to get roughly 24% or 
And I'm going to do this for my bachelor's, my master's, my first professional, and my doctoral degrees. Okay, so now we want to construct the pie chart, all right? We're going to use the central angle that corresponds to each category. And you guys, this is the by hand. Obviously, in this class, we're going to use Excel to do this. Um, this I just want you to know how you would do it if you had to do it by hand. Um, and it's possible that I could ask you for the central angle um, of a sector uh, on the exam. So how do we construct the central angle? To find the central angle, all you do is multiply the relative frequency by 360 degrees. Remember, a circle itself is 360 degrees, and if we multiply it by the proportion that the frequency occurs, then we'll get what's called the central angle. For example, the central angle for associate's degree is 360 degrees times the 0.24 that we found as the relative frequency, giving us a central angle of 86 degrees. In other words, associate's degree is almost a 90 degree angle. All right, so I'm going to calculate the central angle for each of my degree types. All right, we get 86 degrees for associates. Notice bachelors, so this is where math intuition is beautiful. Notice that bachelors, the relative frequency is roughly 50%. Well, what's roughly half of a circle, guys? Hopefully your brain is firing 180 degrees, and you can see that the central angle is 184 degrees, so roughly what you would expect it to be. All right, and now we can see our pie chart. We see our bachelors of 51 degrees, and so what is the central angle? This angle right here would measure 184 degrees. This angle right here for associates would measure 86 degrees, and you can see it's pretty darn close to a 90 degree angle. All right, and we can do the same for the remaining pieces of our, or the remaining types of degree. All right. What does this show us? Again, it just gives us an idea of where our data is. You know, let's describe our data. Well, one way we can describe it is that over one half of the degrees conferred in 2007 were in fact bachelor's degrees. So again, hopefully you're seeing that this all makes a lot of common sense. Descriptive statistics describe our data. All right, let's talk about a Pareto chart, another way to graph qualitative data. A Pareto chart is a vertical bar graph in which the height of each bar represents the frequency or relative frequency. Okay, now here's what makes a Pareto special. The bars are positioned in order of decreasing height, with the tallest bar positioned first or at the left. Okay, so again, that's important. The bars are positioned in order of decreasing height. All right, so let's look at an example. In a recent year, the retail industry lost $36.5 billion in inventory shrinkage. Well, why did this happen? Inventory shrinkage is the loss of inventory through breakage, pilferage, shoplifting, and so forth. The causes of the inventory shrinkage are administrative error, which is $5.4 billion, employee theft, which is $15.9 billion, shoplifting, which is $12.7 billion, and vendor fraud, which is $1.4 billion. All right, we want to use a Pareto chart to organize this data. Okay, well, notice I'm going to make a little table just summing up my, my causes, okay, of loss, of industry loss, and the billions that are attached to them. I start with the most employee theft at 15.9 and I draw a bar. All right, under employee theft, it goes up to 15.9. Similarly, for shoplifting, that's my next largest, and so I draw my bar up to 12.7. All right, and I can do the same for administrative error and vendor fraud. Again, why are we doing this, guys? Simply to describe our data. What, what can we see from this? Well, it's pretty easy to see that the causes of inventory shrinkage that should be addressed first are employee theft and shoplifting. That's the majority of the billions. Okay, we want to talk about graphing paired data sets. All right, one way, all right, is 
well, I guess we'll get to that in just a second with the uh, scatter plot. But what do I mean by paired data? Each entry in one data set corresponds to one entry in a second data set. Okay, so maybe the x-axis could be how long you study, and the y-axis could be your grade on your first statistics exam. All right, so here we have paired data of how long you study and the grade you make. All right, we want to use a scatter plot. The ordered pairs are graphed as points in a coordinate plane, and it's, we're going to use this to show a relationship between two quantitative variables, like I just said, how long you study and the grade you make on the first stats exam. All right, well, let's look at an example. We've got the British statistician Ronald Fisher introduced a famous data set called Fisher's Iris data set. This is actually true. This data set describes very various physical characteristics such as petal length and petal width in millimeters for three species of iris. The petal lengths form the first data set and the petal widths form the second data set. All right, well, as the petal length increases, what tends to happen to the petal width, right? And this should just be common sense, wouldn't you think? As the petal length increases, wouldn't you think the petal width increases? Sure it does. And that's exactly what we see from this scatter plot. All right? And so again, we've got the length and the width plotted as a single point. And we can see by this increase, this linear increase in our points, that yeah, there is what we're going to learn is a correlation. And what is it? It's that as petal length increase. So as petal length increases, what do we see? Well, we see that the petal width increases as well. Okay. All right, lastly, we want to talk here about graphing pair data sets as a time series. A data set is composed of quantitative entries taken at regular intervals over a period of time. All right, the amount of precipitation measured each day for a month, for example. All right, so again, our x axis is time, and our y axis is what we're measuring are the quantitative data. All right, so let's look at an example. The table lists the number of cellular telephone subscribers in millions for the years 1998 through 2008. We want to construct a time series chart for the number of cellular subscribers. Right? Let's let the horizontal axis represent our years, that's our time, and we're going to let the vertical axis represent the number of subscribers in millions. All right, and we're just going to plot the paired data and connect them with the line segments. Okay, and so notice we have 1998 and 69.2. So I go to six, I go to 1998 and I plot 69.2. Similarly, for 1999, we have 86 million subscribers. So I go up here to 86 and plot that point. Okay, and we can see how tele cellular telephone subscribers has increased from 1998 to 2008. All right. R again, you get too much data here. We're not doing anything with average bill for this time for this time chart. Okay. For this time series, we're only looking at year and subscribers. And again, the graph shows that the number of subscribers has been increasing, and it's actually been increasing more steadily here recently. Right? by just looking at the slope between two of the points.